sing about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that name. Amen. God bless you now. Let us all stand and we sing only believe as Brother Ryan comes. <clears throat> only believe. Only believe. All things are possible. Only All things are possible, only believe. Jesus, you're here. Jesus, you're here. All things are possible now that you're here. Jesus, you're here. Jesus, you're here, and all things are possible now that you're here. Let's bow our heads in prayer. In fact, let's read from Romans 8 for, first, and then we'll pray. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead, if that same spirit dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies, by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for your word. We want to thank you for the assurance that you have given us in this hour by coming down yourself in a shout and speaking a message through the lips of your prophet. As you spoke in the book of Deuteronomy that when, you, when, when Moses said, uh, when, when the prophet's lips speak, basically, Father, it's you speaking. And so, Lord, we commit ourselves unto that vindicated word and we ask you, Father, to help us, O oh God, because we know that if we have your Holy Spirit in us, it has not only raised us up with Jesus Christ, setting in heavenly places, but, Father, it also has quickened our mortal bodies. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. <clears throat> Concerning this uh, scripture that we've read of our mortal bodies, Brother Branham said from the paragraph 101, of the rising of the sun, he said, Oh, he'll quicken your mortal bodies, though dead and rotten in the grave, and yet that quickening power rested over that dirt. Hallelujah. Hmm. He that raised up Christ from the dead also quickened your mortal body. The Elijah back there, Elisha and Elisha, now remember the dead man, the prophet, full of that quickening power. Laying in the grave and rotted away, there was so much quickening power till they threw a dead man on him and he come to life. He could still lay hands on the sick, couldn't he? Amen. There you are. Listen, how many of you have a piece of cloth that was taken from Brother Branham's body? How many of you have seen miracles performed by the laying out of that cloth on sick people? I have. I've seen a man with cancer, completely healed of that cancer. So we're talking about the quickening power, and Brother Branham's talking about that quickening power in the body. So let's go to scripture and see where the scripture talks about that incident that Brother Bram brings up about Elisha. In 2 Kings 13 and 21, we read, uh, beginning of verse 20, uh, And Elisha died and they buried him, and the bands of the Moabites invaded the land at the coming in of the year. And it came to pass as they were burying a man, that behold, they spied a band of men, and they cast the man into the sepulcher of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood upon his feet. Talk about quickening power. 
So Brother Ram is making reference to the quickening power of God in the, in the body of one of his anointed servants. And he says, remember, remember that dead man, that prophet, full of that quickening power, laying in the grave and rotted away. There was so much quickening power till they threw a, a dead man on him and he come to life. <coughs> he could still lay hands on the sick, couldn't he? Amen. Well, there you are. Now that confirms what Brother L said to me. Always get your eyes off the vessel and on the God who is using the vessel. And that is so true because a mortal man doesn't have any quickening power, but the God who uses that vessel is uh, the quickening power. It was the Spirit of God that was still remained on that vessel. It was that anointing on the vessel that even down to the bones, when the man was thrown in on Elisha's bones, he came back to life because God is life. He's the author of life. Now, in 1 Peter 3 and 18, we read the Apostle Paul, I mean, the Apostle Peter tells us that even Jesus, uh, who was able to die because of his flesh, yet the God who lived in him quickened his flesh by his spirit. For Christ hath also once suffered in sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in, in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Jesus wasn't quickened by Jesus. He was quickened by God, the Spirit. And that is what Paul tells us in the following two scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, 45. <coughs> and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. In Romans 8, 11 again. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead, and the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead is God. There's 18 verses of scripture that says God raised Jesus from the dead. And if that same spirit of God dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Now basically what the Apostle Paul is telling us here is that if God's spirit that dwelt in Jesus raised his body from the dead, then if that same spirit of God lives in you as he did in Jesus, it will do the same thing for you that it did in Jesus. It'll raise you from the dead, but it also, the signs shall follow them that believe, right? Also, the works that I do shall you do also. It's, it has to, brother, sister, or it's not God. If you, it, look, if you have the Holy Ghost, then everything that Jesus did, you're capable of doing because it's the same nature. It's the same life. It's just that sometimes you have to, well, basically you have to die to your own thinking and let God think for you. Brother Bram explained to us last week, he said, look, he said, when I see visions, let me just explain that. He said, that isn't my thinking. How could a man know what a person's going to do 10 years from now? Or how could a man know what somebody did 10 years ago? He said, but that's, he said, that's God's thinking. And I just get myself out of the way and let him think through me. And then I can tell you what, I, what, I, what, what he's telling me. That's how visions work. In other words, the scripture says in Malachi 3 and 6, I am God, I change not. And Paul told us in Hebrews 13 and 8 the same thing. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Then we know that God must do the same thing and act the same way no matter what vessel he dwells in or he uses. How many believe an animal can speak in tongues? How many believe an animal can speak in a human language? That's a tongue. Well, Balaam's donkey did. Balaam's donkey was anointed by the Holy Ghost and gave a message, a, a dire warning to Balaam the prophet. Now, we read in the following scripture that God is not a respecter of persons, and being no respecter of person, he must act the same way toward everyone without partiality. <clears throat> this is the problem that we have in this message of people say okay he was a holy man and therefore God could use him in a special way but he can't use me because I'm just a nobody and that is just the devil's thinking that's not God's thinking God will use any vessel he wishes to he even used a rock to bring water and that rock followed the people he even used a, a cloud he, he you know he used a burning bush to speak to Moses God, can, he said, I, he can raise up these rocks under ch to become children of Abraham if he wanted to. God is God. He can do whatever he wants to do, and we try to limit God because we, we see our, our own limitations. Now, this tells us, look, <coughs> in, uh, in Romans 2.11 we read, for there is no respect of persons with God. God is not a respecter of persons. And 1 Peter 1.17, And if you call on the Father, who without respect to persons, judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here with fear. 
You know, people think, well, because you're a son of a prophet, therefore uh, you're somebody special. Let me just tell you something. If you're a son of God, you're special. But I can show you in the Bible that there were sons of prophets that were not special. So I would rather be a son of God than a son of the prophet. Just lay that flat out. Now, I'm not disparaging Brother Branham's kids. I'm just saying, I would rather be a spirit-born son of the everlasting father, the creator of the heavens and the earth. That puts me as a brother of Jesus. But just being born in a fleshly manner and having a father in a fleshly manner doesn't make me anything. It doesn't. Now this tells us that no matter who you are or who your parents are, God will judge you by what you do, not who you belong to or who raised you. There are too many people in this message who live, they, they live like Baptists because they think like Baptists. They think as long as I have my doctrine right, and that is all that matters to God. But that is not what we just read in 1 Peter. He said, God will judge you by what you do, the works that you do. And if you do not the works of Christ, you will fall under the judgment. Uh, you will not, if, if you do the works of Christ, excuse me, you will fall under the judgment of Christ. And it's already been judged. And that means that you've already been judged in Christ. But if you do the works of man, you will be judged by the works of man. Then what if you say, well, I don't need to do the works of Christ. Brother Brown did the works of Christ, and I'm counting on that. Listen, the Apostle Paul said in Colossians 3.25, But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. And there is no respect of persons. If I could just get one thing across this morning, there's no respect of persons. You stand on your own with God. You don't stand because uh, you have a prophet. Two million people followed, William, uh, followed Moses and they died in the wilderness. Jesus said they're everyone dead. Now look, God is not a respecter of persons. He doesn't have a law for you and a different law for others. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you're a fornicator in this message or a fornicator out of the message, you're still going to hell. If you're an adulterer in this message or an adulterer out of the message, you're still going to hell. It doesn't matter, well, I've got a prophet, hallelujah, and live any way you want to. We read in Ephesians 6, 8 to 9, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And ye masters do the same thing unto them, forbearing, forbearing threatening. In other words, put off your threatening. Knowing that your master, uh, that your, your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. How many times did Brother Brown say, the Holy Ghost will make a man with a tuxedo, put his arm around a man in overalls. Now, we read in the book of Revelation 22 and 12, and behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. <clears throat> now, who was that speaking? That was Jesus. He said, I, I will bring my reward with me. Why? Because he's the heir. He was the firstborn son. He was the heir. But you notice, he's a joint heir. So he will, he, he says, and, and to give every man according to his work shall be. He has it all and he gives us a portion. Each one of us a portion, making up the entire all. Some wish to argue that we are saved by grace, so why do we need to work? Now, it's true that we are saved by grace because the Apostle Paul taught us this in his letter to Ephesians chapter 2, where he says, Even when we were dead in sins, hath he quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved. And then in verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. But notice, he says that you are saved by grace and that is not yourself. In other words, the saving by grace is not of yourself. But the same apostle who said that grace, <clears throat> uh, uh, said that of grace, was speaking of how you are saved. He is not talking about rewards here at all. He's just talking about how you're saved. You're saved by grace. The rewards are other than the salvation. But this time, notice, this same apostle Paul doesn't, doesn't say this same thing about our reward. In fact, he tells us in 1 Corinthians 3 that our reward is based upon our own labor, which is our own works, as Jesus said in Matthew 16. Notice again, 1 Corinthians 3 and 8. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man, that, and every man shall receive his own reward according to what he's planted. 
according to his labor. You reap what you sow. Therefore, your reward is not based on what William Branham did. Your reward is not based on what Jesus did. Your reward is based on what you do. Not your salvation. Get that out of your mind. It's not the same thing. <clears throat> your reward is based upon what you have done, which is the works that you do. And remember, we just read what the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians 6, 8-9, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord. So you do good, you're going to receive good of the Lord. You do see bad, you do you, you sow bad, you're going to receive bad. In a sermon, blasphemous name, Brother Brown said, Now you know in the Old Testament they took a son and they dressed him in a very nice garment, or in, in a nice garment, and, and set him out before the public, and they had a ceremony of placing, or we call it adopting, in Galatians there. And I think uh, and I kind of think Paul refers to it as adopting sons. Now, by placing a son, ministers will understand, and spiritual Bible readers are placing the son. <coughs> in other words, a son was a son when he was born. All right, by grace are you saved. Not of yourself, it's the gift of God. Not of works, not of, not of self, but it's God. All right. <laughs> now, there's where the Pentecostal people made their mistake. Why? They stop right there. Well, I'm saved, I can live any way I want to. I'm saved. Being born into the family by the Holy Ghost, that's right. But then we must be the right kind of children, tutored by the right tutor. See? <clears throat> well, why does he say that? Because there's no inheritance if you're not the right kind of a son. Oh, you'll be there in the new earth. But you won't be partakers of the new Jerusalem. Now, if you read the 18 sermons Brother Brown preached on Hear Ye Him, and the several others he preached on adoption and the placing of sons, I believe he spent somewhere between 28 sermons in all, teaching us that just to be born is not, uh, is not the all in all. <coughs> but being of such a nature that you are always about your father's business is what is required by God, for there is a reward of inheritance. Also in the same sermon, blasphemous names, <coughs> Brother Branham also says, do you remember over in the book of Matthew, the 17th chapter, the, the first to the fifth verse, Jesus on Mount Transfiguration, you've heard me, hear ye him, that sermon I just uh, hear about a year ago, preached uh, that becomes so popular, hear ye him, the placing of a son in Ephesians 1 and 5 also, God has predestinated us unto the adoption of sons, see, a family, when a son is born into it, it's a son then, but that son uh, had tutors to raise it, and if that son never, <coughs> never did come to the right kind of a son, he never become heir. But if he was the right son and the, and, the, and, and the son that would obey his father, then that son was adopted or placed positionally. He'd become heir of what the father had. And that's what God was doing on Mount Transfiguration when he took his own son after he had proven to be the right son, see, and had stood all temptations, he took him up on Mount Transfiguration and he overshadowed him. <clears throat> so you've got, look, amongst the family of God, you've got some that will be adopted and some they're all born they all had their beginning but they never get to this place of being conformed to the image of the firstborn son now that doesn't mean that they're going to hell it just means they're not the right kind of a son they're not going to be inherited they'll be somewhere out there in the new in the new earth <clears throat> and in a sermon here you hear brother Branham said now if that boy is no good yet he's a son He's never nothing but a son because he's a born, born a son. But if he's not obedient and the right kind of a son, he just continues a son on out without any reward. But if that is an obedient son according to the scripture, then there is an adoption of that son or the placing of that son. And then after he gets a certain age, he's taken out into a public place. And there, and then, and there there's the great ceremony made out before the public. And this son is set up on a high place, and there is a ceremony of adoption. Now think of it now. The father adopts his son into the family. <coughs> and then after that, his son's name is just as good on the check as his dad's. Think about that. It's a public ceremony, and they're all out there, and they see this father positionally place his son. Now you see the difference? You could be baptized with the Holy Ghost. You could be born into the family of God. But if you're not living right, and if you're not conforming to the image of the firstborn son, you're going to be left behind. You go through tribulation period, 
but you, you make it. On the other side, when it comes up in the general resurrection, as sheep who heard his voice, you'll, you'll, you'll come in, but you won't be partaker of the new Jerusalem. Now, it's still not a bad deal. Having eternal life, never getting sick, never getting old, it's not a bad deal. But why settle for that for less? When you can be conformed to the very image of the firstborn son. So what I gather from what Brother Branham is telling us here is that there's a lot of people who will be saved but will have no inheritance because they are not the right kind of a son. Although they've been born into the family, but without being conformed to the image of the firstborn son, they will not be the right kind of a son. And thus they will not, they, they will not become joint heirs with the firstborn son. <clears throat> now notice in Romans 8.17, the Apostle Paul qualifies our sonship by saying, if we suffer with him and are glorified together. Notice he says, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if. See, people want to read that and say, okay, we're children. if we're children, then we're heirs and joint heirs. That, that's it. Not going to read anymore. He said, no, 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 no. If. If so be that we suffer with him, that we also may be glorified together. And dox azo. The dokes of God, the opinions, the values, the judgments of God in the flesh. Magnified. Don't forget what he said in 1 Corinthians 3 and 8 again. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Now in working along in this study of the rising of the sun, Brother Branham said in paragraph 102, he said, and remember, we are flesh of his flesh, Jesus Christ. We are flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. Oh, there's no way out of it. We're going to rise, and that's all there is to it. Just going to rise, that's all. Easter means more than just a tradition. It is also now, for our bodies are now quickened with him. Notice, our bodies are quickened with him. <coughs> and we're setting in heaven, we're set, present tense, we're setting in heavenly places. And this body may rot in the sea, it may rot in the ground, uh, there may not be a spoonful of ashes, but she's coming forth. For the spirit, the spirit, that raised up Jesus from the, uh, my Lord from the dead, has quickened this mortal body. It's quickened your mortal bodies. And we are his beneficiaries of his resurrection, his policy of eternal life. And I, I talk so much about, you know, no wonder he said, fear not. He had no, for, for Paul said, death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? I'm full of that quickening power. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, sir, quickening power, oh my, he is alive forevermore, the same yesterday, today, <coughs> and forever. Again, Brother Bram takes us back to this thought that God changes not, which is Hebrews 13 and 8, and he was in Malachi 3 and 6. He also takes us back to Romans 8, 11, where he said, for the spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead has quickened this mortal body. He also tells us, remember, we are flesh of his flesh, Jesus Christ. We are flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. And this can be found in Ephesians 5 and 30, where Paul says, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. <clears throat> now, notice, we, by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. Not two. Jesus and you. Not three, Jesus, William Branham, and you. One body. And he's the head of that body. Hallelujah. Paul also tells us that we're given this access by, by, by one spirit in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. Again, in Ephesians 2, uh, 2 uh, 18, he says, for through him we have access by one spirit unto the Father. You see, you've got to have the same spirit or you don't have access to the Father. All right? Now, Brother Brown tells us that we are looking down somewhere in the future. We are not looking down somewhere in the future. He says, it is also now, for our bodies are quickened with him and we're setting in heavenly places. From his sermon, Conflict Between God and Satan, he said, now, we're, now we're setting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, and now we have the earnest of our salvation, the first payment. The thing, the thing cost ten thousand uh, uh, dollars. The thing cost ten thousand dollars, and he gave us the first thousand. See, this is the first tenth of our earnest, which 
we've all we've already raised from sin and, 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 and unbelief up into the resurrection with Christ and now setting together in heavenly places with that evidence like Joshua brought back the lands there and we're on our road no more death can't die <clears throat> so when you receive the Holy Ghost you receive the earnest that's the down payment that's your 10% down your tenth your tithing you see you've got the goods Joshua came back. He had a, a load of grapes. He said, we got the evidence. It's there, just like he said it was. When you got the Holy Ghost, it's there, just like he said it was. See, from true Easter seal, he said, now, we are resurrected today. Why can we have such a time over the things of God? Because we're resurrected. Those who he foreknew, he called. Those who he called, he justified. Those who he justified, he has glorified. That's past tense. Then we are now resurrected. You say, well, I don't feel resurrected. That's because your body is only potentially resurrected. As we read a couple weeks ago, Brother Brown said, you are now resurrected. You, but your body is only potentially resurrected. It's been quickened, and it'll be there, but it's not actualized yet. But your soul and your spirit are actualized. See? See? Those who he foreknew, he called, that's past tense. Those who he called, he justified, past tense. Those who he justified, he has, past tense, glorified. Then we are now resurrected. We are resurrected from the inside out, not from the outside in. Do you notice? Not sealed out this way, but sealed in. Oh my, if the church could see that. See, the church doesn't see that. They're looking for the resurrection to be the all in all. The resurrection is just the final, it's, it's like the body it's like, look, it's like the tail has to follow the dog. The dog doesn't follow its own tail unless he's gone mad. His tail's behind him. Your body is, is the least. And so you're resurrected in here. And one day, God will make your body obey your confession. Hallelujah. <clears throat> oh, if the church could see that. See, we're not sealed out. We're sealed in. Them days when sin was an abomination before God and there was no appropriation uh, to take it away, we were sealed away from it. Now, when that ripped in two and that seal was broken by a sin offering being made for us, now we're baptized inside and sealed inside. We are resurrected. We are now resurrected, already resurrected. Now, do you know <coughs> the Bible said so? <coughs> We are now resurrected. We are now raised with him in spiritual resurrection. What does the word quicken mean? Quicken means resurrection. That's right. We're already resurrected right now, setting together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, enjoying the Easter seal. Amen. That's God's true Easter seal. How are we? By one spirit baptized into one body and sealed eternally. We are now raised spiritually. Now, what did, what did we raise from? From a life of sin? We were once sinners and loved the things of the world. But now we have moved so far. Uh, well, let's just move forward. All right. Notice in verse one, uh, paragraph 103, he says, Notice Messiah, the, the anointed one. So is his bride, the Messiah. Let's see the anointed one. Notice. Death does not stop God's quickening power. Death can't stop it. When you've got it, it's eternal. There ain't nothing going to stop it. You can't harness it. You can't do nothing to it. If your life if you live your life out, that still don't stop it. It's just as good as it was. See, notice, Moses was full of that quickening power, was he? <clears throat> he was a prophet who the word came to. He was part of the word. He was the word of that day. Is that right? And after he was dead 800 years on Mount Transfiguration, there he stood with Elisha. <clears throat> Is that right? The quickening power, death don't never take it away. No, no, I'll raise it up again. The angels come, buried him down there in the valley. He had been rotten and gone. His bones was gone and everything else, but the quickening power was still there. It quickened him and brought him up, and there he was standing there. Now, listen, that was 800 years later. <clears throat> now, let's just quickly read from Scripture concerning this event talking about Moses more than 800 years after he had died he see, uh, to be seen again in his flesh according to the gospel testimony we see it in Matthew we see it in Mark and we see it in Luke in Matthew 17 1 we read and after six days Jesus taketh Peter James and John his brother and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart and was transfigured before them and his face did shine as the sun <coughs> and his reign as white as the snow excuse me
And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. And then answered Peter, saith unto him, <coughs> unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man, save Jesus only. <clears throat> so they had seen three men. All right, not just some apparition. Again, we see in the Gospel of Luke 9 and 28, and it came to pass about uh, and, and eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into the mountain to pray. And as he prayed, and I want you to just notice, this scripture says eight. All right, we're going to find another scripture actually says six. I'm going to explain that. And he took Peter, James, and John and went up into the mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the, the, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistening. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elijah. Not angels, not spirits, men. Now men are, you know, flesh and bone, and 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 uh, and, and spirit and soul. Okay. Who appeared in, in who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep, and then they were awake. They saw his glory, and the two men that stood with him. And it came to pass, as they departed from him, Peter said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Not knowing what he said. And sometimes we speak, <clears throat> and we don't know what we're saying. While he thus spake, there came a cloud and overshadowed them, and they, fear, and they feared as they entered into the cloud, and there came a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. And when the voice was passed, Jesus was found alone, and they kept it close, and no man, uh, no man, uh, and told no man in those days any of those things which they had seen. <clears throat> and one more we see in the in the Gospel of Mark, and he said unto them, Verily I say unto you that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. And after six days, now remember we just read after eight days, and after six days Jesus taken. And, and if you go back to uh, you know, the, the book of Luke, you see that actually in verses 25 to 28, he's talking about the kingdom coming with power. All right? Now, it says, it came, it came to pass after eight days. Here it says, and after six days, Jesus taken him apart, Peter, James, and John, and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his raiment became shining exceedingly white as snow, so as, uh, as no fuller on earth uh, can white them. And there appeared unto them Elijah and, him, and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he wist not what to say. In other words, he didn't, he didn't know what to say, so he just opened his mouth and just talked. For they were sore afraid. <clears throat> and there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and the, and the voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. He's the one you want to hear. Suddenly, when they looked around about, they saw no man anymore, save Jesus only with them. So they notice they saw no man anymore. So those men were there. It wasn't uh, an apparition. It wasn't like, uh, you know, uh, a fog and, and kind of in the fog there's some, you know, celestial beings. It was not celestial beings. It was people, Moses and Elijah. So we see that William Branham was talking about the man Moses who was an anointed vessel of God that God used, and that anointing from God raised up Moses, and he was seen 800 years after he died. <clears throat> now, not to get off track, but I, 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 I do not know if you caught it. You had to because I brought it out. But in the Gospel of Luke, he said, they began to journey up the mountain about eight days after Jesus talked to them concerning his death and resurrection. And in the book of Mark, he said it was about six, he said it was six days after Jesus talked to them that they began their journey up the mountain. <clears throat> now I'm bringing up this because these two accounts have been written and, and we've been, they've been read for more than 2,000 years and it has not caused people to go into a shock and say one of them lied uh, like they've been doing with Brother Branham concerning the cloud. Well, they don't line up, you know, what Brother Branham said about the date doesn't line up scientifically, so blah, blah, blah. Listen, 
Here is scripture. And if you're going to say they lied, then you're going to throw out Mark and you're going to throw out uh, Luke. Just throw them out. Because they lied. Or notice, let me just read. The dates mean nothing to God because God is infinite. In 2 Peter 3 and 8, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. So in God's terms, the difference between two days is actually in seconds, not even in minutes. Do you know that would compute in God's days to 1.35 minutes, or about 80 seconds of difference in their storytelling? Now, if I had two people in here, and they told me that at 9, one person says, well, at 9.01, uh, so-and-so came, came out of his car and he entered the church. Another one says, well, at 9.02 and a half. Does it really make a difference? The fact is, the timing is not, is not important, but the event is all important, because Brother Branham four months before the event spoke to us and told us that the cloud would come and in it would be the angels of God. That's what's important. The spoken word and the vindication of that word. Now, in getting back to our study in paragraph 104, Brother Branham says, <clears throat> now, notice, you say, well, is that right, Brother Branham? After 800 years? Oh, my. If you, re if you read in Matthew, I, I got the scripture here, Matthew 27, 51. You can write it down, put it down. When all those back there that believed that he would come, the Bible said here, after he come, they were sleeping in the ground, quickening power was upon them, and they were a part of him, them saints, and they were part of him because they believed on him, and potentially they had the life through the sacrifice of the sheep, a propitiation, uh, which would never bring spirit of the sheep back upon the man. Uh, how about now with the spirit of man, God himself upon him, see, how much more quickening power uh, do we have? But through the propitiation of the, uh, uh, for the sin was offered in a lamb and type, uh, what we have now is not the type, it's the antitype. So what are we scared of? In other words, Brother Branham is saying in Matthew 27, 51, it says, and many of the saints who slept in the ground arose and were seen of many. There was 500 witnesses actually in the book of Acts. 500 witnesses that the resurrection had taken place. And they'd seen. As Brother Branham said, Abraham was, you know, said, you know, Lord, can we do a little stopover? In, uh, in the city, he said, I, I, I'd love to see how it's changed. And, uh, God, and the Lord said, yeah, that's fine. And uh, they were walking around town, Brother Brown says, and all of a sudden they got spotted, so then they vanished. You know, those glorified bodies can walk through walls. Well, anyway. <clears throat> he goes on 105. And those fellows who only had a type pointing to the resurrection and went down into the grave with it. Now there's Job back there under the great strain. My, everything took away from him. The devil said, now let me have him. I'll, I'll make him curse you to your face. And then he broke, and then he broke loose. He said, don't you take his life. <coughs> and he all but taken his life. And his wife even turned against him, said her, uh, said her breath had become a stranger, uh, uh, had become strange to him. In other words, she, she'd had nothing to do with him. She didn't seem to love him anymore. She just pushed him away. But, and Job, you're miserable. Why don't you just curse God and die, she said. And he said, you talk like a foolish woman. See, oh my, see. He held right to what he had. Now, he's a prophet. He said, I am not a sinner. I have offered the, the provided sacrifice. Amen. He knew where he was standing. He was on the word. No matter what the other said, he was right there at the word. And, and, and then that great tremendous hour, he said, you speak like a foolish woman. He said, the Lord gave and the Lord taketh away. Why, blessed be the name of the Lord. He said, I come into this world without anything. I come, I come here naked. <coughs> I'll go out <coughs> the same way. <coughs> blessed be the name of the Lord. <coughs> Setting there, broke out in boils, his kids dead. He was poverty stricken. And his, and his friends all turned against him and his church members and everything else scraping himself with and, and what a miserable wretch none of you ever been through that yet still he held to that word he was an eagle oh my you can't keep the film over his eye all the time no no all at once standing on that word what happened the skies peeled back 
the thunders begin to roll, roar. The lightning begin to flash, and Job looked up, and he saw a vision. And he said, I know my Redeemer liveth, and at the last days he'll stand upon this earth. And though after the skin worms has destroyed this body, bones and all, that quickening power will be there. I'll see God for myself, whom I shall see for myself. My eyes shall behold him and not another. Is that right? Though after my reins be consumed within me, though after the skin worms that's in my body now will destroy it. You know the skin worms don't come to you. That worm is already in you. Your own skin worms. Did you ever notice that? You put, uh, put you in a coffin and put it airtight, and the bugs will eat you up just the same because they're in you. You are just a, a bunch of bugs to begin with on the inside. Though the skin worms, my skin worms, destroys me, my flesh, yet in my flesh I'll see God. And on that resurrection morning, glory, hallelujah, Matthew, this great writer, 2751, <clears throat> said after he was resurrected from the dead, that Old Testament saints, many of those that slept in the dust of the earth, came out of the grave and entered into the city and appeared unto many. That quickening power still on them bones of Elijah. When there was no more bones still on Job, when there wasn't a spoonful of dust left of his body, but the quickening power was still there. And if the spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he'll also quicken your mortal body. <clears throat> and why is that? Because it is the spirit that quickens the mortal body. And the spirit of God, the spirit is God's spirit, the same God that breathed into Adam the breath of lives, the same spirit of God that was imparted to the believers in, in, in the upper room where Jesus breathed on them and said, receive ye the Holy Spirit. And notice, Brother Bram says, notice quickly now, you say, oh, I, I, I wish that I lived back in, you live in a better time. Now, if you all, and, and I see you putting down uh, some scripture, all right, then put down 1 Thessalonians 4.16. Notice now how beautiful, see? In the, the saints, uh, in the saints, them that sleep in Christ will God bring with him, see? Saints in the grave, resting like Elijah was, resting like Elisha was, see? Some of them, uh, some of them will be quickened, some of them will be uh, taken, some will be in the grave, they will go in. The trumpet of God shall sound, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, the quickening power on the living, the quickening power on the dead. Let's bow our heads in prayer. <clears throat> Gracious Father, we just pray, Lord, with hands lifted up, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you would give us, O oh God, of your Spirit in a measure, Lord, that's commensurate with who we are. And Father, as your bride, we are to be bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh. O oh God, we, we, we believe that we are to be conformed to the image of the firstborn Son. We believe, Father, that we are to be manifested sons. We believe that we are to be uh, joint heirs with Christ. We believe that we are to be adopted. So, Father, we just pray in believing all these scriptures, we ask, Lord, that you would bring in our bodies a quickening, that our bodies would obey our confession. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. And that we would be, Lord, ready for the resurrection time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, <clears throat> I know who I have believed it. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know whom I have believed.